That's the, that's the clap of syncing things, so I can sync the audio. <laughs> uh, I don't have a clapper. No, no, you ruined it. Now there are two claps. It's, there's going to be an echo. That's the real clap. <laughs> uh, all right. So welcome to Farcast, or whatever the hell we're going to call this, because, you know, we're very indecisive. Uh, I guess I am your host, Ian, and joining me tonight, I have three different fantastical people from across the internet joining us to talk about random giant robot stuff, or regular sized robot stuff, if they feel like it. I guess uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves, not all at once, please? <laughs> uh, I can go first, I guess. Uh, and so my you shall. Yeah, all right. Uh, my name's Ethan, or Crow, whichever. I'm the resident Iron Kingdoms aficionado, I guess. Uh, and as far as, like, I'm not well educated, by ha but I have a lot of opinions, so I, I'm pretty sure that makes up for it. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, as far as, like, creative projects go, I guess the closest thing I have to that is I, I have a lot of butt hurt when it comes to various tabletop games. Like, I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, that's about it, honestly. <laughs> oh, let the butt hurt flow through you. I'm sure it's a powerful source of motivation. So, uh, it really is. Yes. Who's you're next on the chopping block. You're, you're podcasting from a standing desk right now. I, <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Power stance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. All right, Peter, you volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is. I worked with. <laughs> All right, seriously, for real. My name is Peter Vanderhoeven. I did the voice acting for a bunch of Kilroy's animations. I also did some script writing work. I do some like little writing things on the side, but I'm not ready to show any of that yet. Um, I'm glad to be on here. I'm a big Mick Warrior fan, just like Kilroy. Well, we're glad to. Have you here, and I'm Kilroy, by the way. Uh, that's my username. For anyone that was confused. You can also call him Ian. That's what I do. You can, but, you know, that might be confused with Ethan over there, so... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was being such an impediment to this podcast. Although. I know, I know, but <laughs> we gotta have a red shirt, okay? Have to have an expendable guy. I I'm, I'm wearing, like, a purple... Undertale shirt, which I think puts me below. Uh, oh hell! Is it the one? With, is it the one with like the big heart shield on it? Yes, yeah, the crest one. Fuck so, yeah! Like, that that's like so trash tier fandom wise that I'm guessing that puts me below red shirts. So I, I am ready and able and willing to die for this podcast. I mean that. I guess that gives us two red shirts. <laughs> I salute you, Ethan. <laughs> but who's the second red shirt? Uh, I mean, I could go upstairs and change if Not you want. It. <laughs> Just introduce yourself. I think you're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I am. My name is Daniel Bruins. Uh, I am a giant robot mech warrior nerd. You can find me on like DC Bruins on YouTube and Sir Dub Dub. Basically, everywhere else people would bother to post art. Um, I do like uh mech warrior battle tech flash animations uh a bit of like comic book work illustration uh have been taking up writing over the last like four or five years or so um orchestral music composition um cool wow i'm a dm yeah. for my for it for my D, D group uh what else do we have i don't know you're you're sort of uh Outshining all of us. You're making us look I, bad, damn it. <laughs> well, I also I, play electric guitar, so. Hell yeah. Oh, is this just a pissing contest now? Uh, yes. I didn't bring uh, all oh. my accomplishments with me, sorry. Uh, no, to, to, be, to, like, to be perfectly clear, I never said I did, it, did any of these things well. <laughs> Fair. It's just implied, because I've listened to your stuff and seen your animations, and it's pretty damn good, but I've never been part of your uh, DM group, so maybe you were, like, really terrible at that to balance it all out, hope, or I'm going to feel really insecure. Um, I mean, the last time we had an incidental character, uh, a unicorn who was standing in line at Magical DMV became the party's mascot. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> I love it. 
He ended up just like defending a door against its, uh, an army of like reforming skeletal snakes for like three days while the party delved into the dungeon. It was great. Nice. It's like something right out of Chainsaw Man. Chainsaw Man? Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, one of them Japanimations that you hear sometimes about on the internet. Oh, mm. fucking weed. Uh. Disgusting. <laughs> Look, we're all like weeb level here, even if it's not specifically weeb stuff. So yeah, I mean, giant robots—it's sort of required. Yeah, pretty much. Also, to the viewers at home, this is our first podcast. Like, not just for the series, but ever. You could say that it's a pilot of sorts. Yeah, it's gonna be a bit rough, a bit unstructured. So, I mean, we're not gonna be like. The Joe Rogan Experience, or <laughs> the Please Stop Talking podcast. We're going to yeah. be better. So anyway, so tell, tell me about your experience with DMT. <laughs> DMT what? Is it like, that's that's the thing, right? It's like, here's, here's we're going to bring on like a whole bunch of, like this wide range of interesting people and just ask them, every single one of them, about their experience with hallucinogenic drugs. That's the Joe Rogan experience. Well, let me tell uh, you something, Dub Dub. <laughs> Mech Warrior is one hell of a fucking drug, dude. <laughs> uh, this LSD is also. <laughs> I mean, shit, compared to the drugs, kid. Yeah. The Mech Warrior drugs. Uh, this is actually the first time I have met, or I guess I've talked with Sir Dub Dub. Or uh, what, what did you say your real name was? Uh, Dan. Anything? Yeah. Dan, Daniel, anything but Danny. Uh, fair enough. I'll try not to reenact uh, The Shining. I don't think uh, I've I, ever actually heard your guys' anyone's hears voices before. So this is, or like voices outside of it, like on a non, in a non scripted context. So oh yeah, yeah. weird. Actual humans, actual human interaction. I've missed this. Yeah, so, I've no, done this yet. No, it's I guess. okay. I'm I'm not human. Uh, I have to dip for just like literally like three three minutes. I'll be right back. All right. Okay. I'll start a, start a timer. Oh no. <laughs> Oh god. What the fuck? What? I, I think you might be making some kind of mixed drinks or something. Some kind of mech formula. Could be. No, I don't know. It, it's injecting that scorpion juice. <laughs> I don't know. Comparing uh, Mech Warrior to uh, drugs, yeah, I, I think drugs are way cheaper than Mech Warrior. Have you seen how much, you know, the, those miniatures and MWO costs? Just heroin would be oh, cheaper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure which is worse. The fact that the Iron Wind Metals minis cost like 20 bucks each, or the fact that the MWO Max cost 20 bucks each. Uh, MWO Max, because those are literally infinite. It doesn't take any sort of pewter or lead to reproduce them, and there's no finite quantity. So charging it, you know, as much as an entire game for a single playable unit in a multiplayer game that will one day if shut down and be annihilated from existence is pretty bad. Excellent point. Definitely. Yeah, I, I like parts of MWO, but I, pl I have plenty of gripes about it. I think most of us do, to be honest. Yeah, I want to so like I guess it. Our, <laughs> I want to. I guess our de facto first topic is MWO. Let's go. Uh, well, I got into MWO as part of the closed beta. I was invited by the guys at No Guts, No Galaxy back then because we were working together. Uh, on the Decision oh, wow. at Thunder Rift project, uh, which was going to be a Mac Warrior fan game before MWO came out. I was terrible. I didn't do too much on the project. I made the Wolverine Mac, uh, the Union Dropship, and two types of hovercraft. Um, but the second we got anywhere on the project, we essentially decided to pull the plug because we knew we'd never be able to get secure the license and that if we got any bigger... Um, Ops games would probably come down on us and say, hey, you can't try to sell that, so we're going to not do that. We're going to make our own stuff and keep it to fan projects and go our own ways. And that's sort of what we've been doing since. Mm. Ah, yes. Piranha Games ruining everything again. <laughs> or as usual. You know, my experience with MWO is I, I got in through the, the Founders Pack program, the one where you could, like, uh, like buy... A package of mechs but then also like get access to the beta and yeah yeah holy shit that was such a goddamn motherfucking waste i swear to fucking god like the game just turned out so much worse 
than I expected. Yeah, did you uh, get the second Founders pack that they introduced later with the Operation Phoenix mechs? Wait, there was another one? Yeah, uh, a few years after the uh, release of MWO, they put out uh, the Operation Phoenix mechs, so I think it was like the Thunderbolt, Locust, uh, I forget the other two off the top of my head. Uh, uh, but you could... Wolverine and Battlemaster. That was it, yeah. Um, and you could pay the same amount you paid Shadow for Hawk the... Shadowhawk and Battlemaster, sorry. Oh yeah, I, th now I remember yeah. there were six mechs. They added the Wolverine mm -hmm. and another, a fourth or sixth one. I can't count today. Uh, later on. Welcome back, Crow. We're just complaining Hello. about MechWar Online. Oh yeah, like, uh, I dabbled in that for, a, like, a little bit. And even with somebody with, like, next to no experience in Mech, Mech Warrior or Battletech or anything like that, I knew really janky. <laughs> yeah. Something's wrong with your mic, Ethan. Uh, can you hear me all right now? Uh, someone's running a buzzsaw right. in your room? Sorry, sorry. Oh, I, uh, there we I go. forgot to turn my mic on. That was my laptop mic that was on. Oh, oh yeah, no. Do it. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so we were talking about the Founders Pack for MWO and, you know, how much that stung, uh, seeing the final product. Were you part of that? Uh, me? Yes. Uh, no. I, I have very limited, uh, MechWarrior experience. A lot of, like, most of mine is through Peter. Oh, like, fair uh, enough. I, I, we, we played some Battletech. And I grew up with a couple of the Mech Warrior games, though those are only like tangentially in the same universe, from what I've been told. The Mech Assault ones. Yeah, Mech Assault. Sorry, a lot of names to keep straight. Yeah, they're pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, and my uh, the only thing I have to add is that uh, my favorite mechs are the Mackie and the Catapult. <laughs> those are the best ones. Interesting you, combination. You uh, you looking forward to the next text talks? Apparently, that's the Mackie. Uh, well, that that's. I'm glad they're. I'm I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad it's coming up. The Mackie is an excellent design. The OG fat ass. <laughs> but yeah, the what purveyor. about you, uh, Dan? Uh, what's your experience with MWO? Oh, jeez. Um, I remembered the old uh, Smith and Tinker trailer where the yeah. dude is like fighting an atlas in the middle of the city and it's like oh yeah they're yeah, both the old being... five one yeah and like everyone's being really stupid about like how they're like moving their machines around and like tactically positioning things but like whatever it's amazing it's such a good solid understanding of just like the cacophony and like sheer metallic power of these things it just like it just instantly sold me on it yeah, I need uh, to show you that later, Ethan. Like, there was a, this trailer for Mech Warrior Five, but it wasn't the Mech Warrior Five that we got. Yeah, in, like, yeah. in 2019, it was back in like 2010 or 11. Like 2009, it, well, maybe it was like really early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was before Mech Warrior Online, and it was just fucking sick. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, like, you, I, yeah, yeah. Does anyone happen to remember Mech Warrior Prime? No. This is the game that was supposed to be Mech Warrior 5, and there's a single leaked trailer out, and it's uh, got a CGI vulture, the Mech Warrior 4 style vulture, running across a forest yeah. landscape. And that, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know, like, not just for, like, uh, Battletech stuff, but that seems to be, like, a common through line with a lot of, like, especially not big budget but kind of mid-range budget games is there'll be some really really well put together trailer and then inevitably something will happen along the lines and the end product will look nothing like it yeah oh you yeah. want to have fun video games no i'm sorry kid you can't yeah pretty yeah. much every single mech warrior game has actually gone through that uh specifically mech warrior 2 and 3 uh mech warrior 2 the trailer which is used as the intro for the game was done by Lightstorm Studios which is the same studio that did the special effects for movies like Terminator 2 and Aliens mm. uh, but that's why that trailer looks so freaking good and it's also why none of the mechs in the Mech Warrior 2 intro look anything like the mechs in the game uh, or the other cinematics in that game because it was done by a different studio and they didn't have access to any of the files for future development mm. it wasn't like the Mech Warrior 2 engine 
basically made out of like duct tape and wishes and it was like barely holding it together and able to render more than like two mechs on screen at a time oh by yeah the time it came out it's pretty janky but it's so much fun yeah it's not janky it is a marvel of engineering <laughs> <laughs> getting it to run is such a headache but when it does it's it's not lovely. janky it's advanced technology <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's technically correct yeah. Yeah, and uh, but then we moved on to Mac Warrior Three, and the trailer for that is completely different. It's got James Earl Jones doing the freaking voiceover at the beginning, which is amazing. But they replaced him with some other guy for Wait, the official what? game. Yeah, uh, if you can find the very original Mac Warrior Three trailer, it's got James Earl Jones. Oh, that's so cool. Um, yeah, uh, well, I really hate that when like, especially for games that are sequels, uh, and there's like a voiceover or something, especially for like a pre-established character. The big example I can think of is uh, Dishonored 2, uh, where they released a trailer for it, and the character who plays uh, the outsider is the same guy as before, and that's a really great voice. And then the game came out, and it was a completely different guy who doesn't sound nearly as good. Oh. It feels bad, man. Yeah. I have to wonder if there was a contractual conflict, or if he got sick and couldn't record the other half of his lines. Who the or... hell knows? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Sometimes. just like wondering, if, if you all... If you already have James Earl Jones's voice recorded, but then you like it doesn't show up in the final. Did you like lose the rights to the voice lines you already had? What happened there? I think because uh, it's the uh, you know in the future. I can't remember the Mac Warrior Three opening uh, verbatim, but it's like the year is thirty fifty. You know, it is uh, the thirty first century, and mankind is once again at war. Yeah, that 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 line. He does that whole intro and nothing else. But I think they want. They wanted to keep the original voice cast because in the original trailer they uh, they have a lot of the same stuff that's in the Mac Warrior Three intro, but they changed the voice actors and the plot quite a bit. Like all of a sudden, characters that were women are suddenly men, and women are men back and forth. And vice versa. Vice versa. Uh, it, it's very odd. The sound effect quality is terrible, and they've completely re-rendered certain things like. Uh, um, there's a lot of footage of, like, uh, the destroyed city that you see in the intro, but it, it looks like something out of World War II. There's almost 1940s-style cars and bicycles in the street, like skeletons. I think I know the one you're talking about. Yeah. I think some of that footage was used for the, like, the ending cinematic? Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's got some of the same stuff we've seen in the same opening, just done a little differently, like... Uh, summoner or thor crashes through like a brick wall and they actually like animated each individual brick in a way that's kind of neat but oh that's so cool yeah it's it's fun but it's kind of garbage <laughs> in a certain <laughs> way because the whoever did that intro was terrible at scaling i complained about the fireflies which are 30 ton mechs are oh yeah they're like you know, they're like infantry sized yeah they're, they're so much smaller than the summoner which is 70 tons like they should be about oh. half as tall or so no, you know you, it, you, you're, so you're make a drama, really. Yeah. It, for, it's 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 the far future. These mechs are built using just like ore that is is harvested from the cores of neutron stars. It's fine. They're just super super dense. <laughs> that or the uh, summoner is fifty percent helium or something. I don't know. <laughs> helium. They, they they call it foamed titanium for a reason. <laughs> you see, they they make the the summoner. You know, they make it in different sizes. You know, you've got the little kid size, you got the normal one, you've got the big <laughs> gulp. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone gets the size of the summoner wrong because people don't realize that the height ends at, at the shoulder, not at the rocket launcher. And so some will sort of, or the other way around, where they'll uh, scale things up. You know, so that without the rocket launcher pod on top, it's, let's say, 9 meters tall. But then they stick the rocket launcher on top, so all of a sudden it's 11 meters tall. But it's, it's way bigger than it should be, because someone did the math wrong at some point. Because it's always so much taller than every other mech. Proper size scaling, like, especially for non-human shit, even if it, like, has humanoid shape, is a lot harder than... It's one of those things yeah. where you don't really give people credit when they get it right. But when they get it wrong, it's like such a big deal. Yeah, personally, definitely. in the case of the summoner, I blame Nikolai Malthus. Of course, uh, 
Yeah, clearly. <laughs> we this is Michelle, and now all the mechs are made out of helium. It's fine. <laughs> Who's Nikolai and Malchus? Uh, he was, I, I shit you not, a Saturday morning cartoon villain for the Battletech Saturday morning cartoon. Oh, no. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I, mean, I wish I could find, or somebody could find, like, recordings of that series that aren't in shit quality. Like, people give it a bunch of crap for, like, the voice acting and stuff, but... It looks fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> yeah, when they when they in the the few scenes that they they bothered to like hand animate the mechs instead of switching to to their to the like the oh it's fancy new three D technology. Look at this nineties kids like which like, to enhanced imaging. Yeah, like but in like the opening they have they have this shot of like. A mauler just getting destroyed from across the like the, across a city street, um, and that like you could feel the the sort of weight of the machine and like the the sheer like destructive environmental power of like all the weapons going off around it. It's goddamn great sometimes. But yeah. then like in the actual show, they have, it's like for budgetary and like time reasons they have to switch to this cheaper alternative animation method i get it but like the few scenes that were hand drawn were mm, real nice yeah the uh the 3d scenes always kind of bugged me because everything falls at the same speed regardless of scale like they knock yeah. over an elemental and it take it's like it's like they're on the moon just uh, they slowly float down to the ground at the same <laughs> speed that you know a giant mech would like oh they're the size of a two meter tall person <laughs> I kind of like got into the headcanon that this was all of this like enhanced imaging stuff was just like some tactical computer like replaying the battle in some sort of like simulated program. And so like all that jankiness is just, oh, that's just the computer not knowing how to render this particular way this mech falls or whatever. Yeah, uh, whatever helps you sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's or maybe they just got, you know, cartoon gravity on Tharkad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that sort of makes sense to me. Uh, it's... We have new technology from the new Avalon Institute of Science. It lets us change the gravity on Tharkad to cartoon gravity. Cartoon gravity. Yeah. Can it, can it make it any weapon. less cold, though? So, uh, Crow, you mentioned earlier your favorite mech is the Mackie or the Catapult. So what is yeah. everyone's favorite mechs? Looking at you, raccoon. I'd say mine is the Vulcan, without a doubt. In fact, if you, if any of you have watched the Crescent Fortress animation on Kilroy's channel, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, no, no, no. You just hit the render button and just like upload it immediately when it's done. You don't even like double check anything. I honestly yeah, have I, a hard time watching my own animations, but I uh, continue. Yeah. <laughs> so one. You know, the Vulcan is the weirdo looking medium mech with the like orb cockpit that looks like it came off the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. So I voiced the guy who piloted that mech, but also, fun fact, I was the one who suggested he put it in there. You did, you did. I voiced the guy that needed to pee. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I have one line of dialogue. <laughs> Oh that one. man, that that moment where like the dude is just like standing in the street, just doing his thing, and the mech awkwardly like like turns around to look at him. They make eye contact, and the mech turns away. That was so good. I'm gonna be honest. I planned so much of the video around that stupid gag. Oh, that's oh, it landed. I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that one. I've seen most of your animations, but uh, there's some gaps in my knowledge. Well, uh, uh, you I, should fix that. Yeah. This scene Spoiler was from alert, the, the scene was from the Crescent Fortress one, you know, the one where I was. The, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, now it was later you're... on the video. Yeah, it was. Oh yeah, now I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Also, like for those of the audience who are like joining this and don't know about Kilroy stuff, he does 3D animated Mech Warrior videos. You know, I. I'm involved in voice acting them and scripting them, and Kilroy does the animation and the basic scripting. Go check him out. 
Look for Farseer Animations on YouTube. Uh, you're actually already here, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. just just go down, click on the Farseer Animation thing, and and scroll well, down to case, some video. In case the podcast makes it onto like Spotify or something. Well, hit the hit the subscribe button and then hit the real subscribe button. Oh, that, that, that's that's true. We gotta gotta make sure uh, everyone knows that for the whole fifteen people. Hit the people subscribe that button this. and ring yeah. the bell. Yeah. So hit, uh, smash the like button. But like the thing is, pe- the people people actually do that because it actually works. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I, like I, I, you, I feel so, so sad for the people that feel like forced and compelled to say that because it actually makes a difference. Oh, yeah. We live in a hellscape. I, yeah. I've been tempted to do that as a gag uh, in a Mech Lab video, but like have it be under duress, like someone shoots my character in the leg as I refuse to <laughs> to say no. I'm not going to say the lines, and every time I refuse, they just keep shooting me <laughs> until I get it all out. Tell them to smash the like button, motherfucker. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, being, you, you're being if you like, don't tell hell, them what the hell, family's next yeah you you're gotta being, you, you, mean gotta, like, hell, you gotta layer things in like a fine dust of irony that's how you appeal to young people oh, of oh, course God, i'm clipping so much in audacity oh no well we have uh i'm recording you so if i fuck up too you know i'm gonna blame you yeah like as long as i'm coming through fine discord hopefully everything will be fine hopefully so, so, Sir Dub, what's your favorite mech, would you say? Uh, Hunchbro for life. Hunchback? Hunchback. Uh, like oh, it's, yeah, it's, that's it's a, a good co- one. It's a toss-up between the Hunchback and, like, the sort of redesigned Locust. Uh, the mm. Hunchback specifically, because, like, that is that is the machine that I started the MWO, fa- like, Founders Pack with, and that's just, like, the old warhorse I've been just tooling around the galaxy with, I guess, for the last how many years um there is something utterly and immensely satisfying about charging into a battle in this machine that is smaller than it needs to be but tougher than you think it is Mm. uh sacrificing everything uh like everything beyond your left ear to make sure that you can keep that one gigantic cannon round in place for the one shot that you absolutely need to make to just tear something apart. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a pocket battleship or something. It yeah. just it shoots so far beyond its weight. You can't really go wrong with it. And like any any time like a really a really solidly made like AC20 like uh, the animation of the sound of it like it has to like it sounds thunderous you know that gigantic god slamming a car door sound as and you, as you watch this <laughs> as you watch this round just like slowly fly for like three four five seconds and then the the thing that had been wasting your enemy team it just ceases to be it's so satisfying yeah that uh it's like the bolter you have to do it like correctly noise wise yeah. for the yeah. effect to be there yeah, the bolter from 40k. Yeah. And then yeah. the 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 locust is in all honestly I think is growing to be my favorite mech to draw and animate because it's it's like this weird it's like a it's like a little race car, you know? And it's yeah. so it's so nervous everywhere like ever it goes. It's so it's it's twitchy and it I had this like I you keep having this idea of it's uh every time it turns a corner it's like sliding everywhere and it's uh just like barely holding together and like barely standing up you know and something yeah. about like bird max in particular definitely it's, yeah it's like an ATST from Star Wars but it's Usain Bolt yeah yeah it's an ATS ATST on Nitro I can definitely I also, see that. I, I also like I, I, someone brought it up in the the Farseer chat a while ago. Um, this image of uh, a locust uh, just like kicking or stomping at a bunch of elementals like a secretary bird does with a cobra. <laughs> I think yeah, that's that's perfect. That's great. <laughs> I haven't seen. Oh, that. Also, if you sneeze at it, it completely explodes, and I love that. That's Glass the best part. <laughs> All right. Uh, what about you, Kilroy? I'm going to uh, be greedy. Our, our fearless leader. What's your favorite mech? I have three. Um, 
And I guess I'll start with uh, the one mech that comes to mind whenever someone says the word mech, and that's the Kit Fox. The piece of shit 30 ton clan mech. Because uh, it, it's so prevalent in the Mech Warrior 2 games, it's almost exclusively what you fight throughout most of it. So, being a little two year old running around uh, in the game shooting little kit foxes all day long, I just thought, oh, that's what a mech looks like. <laughs> um, it's, it's so terrible. It can't torso twist in that game or even normally. Um, and and it, it's such. It's so much fun to just blow apart. It's completely useless. Um, <laughs> and I just think it looks adorable. Yeah. Um, which is why I did the whole Kit Fox challenge on my gaming channel where I only play the game with uh, the Kit Fox because it's oh, such a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, I didn't get to explain it, but it's pretty much the reason why I love Vulcan. Like, it's just such a strange looking poorly armed piece of shit mech yeah like nobody else likes it because you know like i mentioned earlier i think it looks like it came from like it looks like some kind of like martian bipod from war of the worlds <laughs> nice. like and it's only got like this shitty little auto cannon a machine gun a, a single laser beam and a flamethrower which doesn't do jack shit against fucking mechs or tanks yeah, like, it's it like is. it's it's like they built like the the chassis, the skeleton of the mech, and then they just like forgot to add the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, like, it's built as an anti-infantry mech, if I recall correctly, but mm -hmm. like that just makes it so lame in comparison to everything else. Uh -huh. like, it's an ironic choice, really. God, terrible mechs are so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. They're the absolute best. I love them. Yeah, um, I mean, the Vulcan being anti-infantry sort of makes sense for early battle tech because infantry were supposed to be the uh, absolute bane of mech's existence because they could just run up and toss an explosive in between one of the mech's joints when it's not looking and blow it up or, or use like a single have, like, Inferno yeah, SRM to cook it. Yeah, yeah. Inferno SRM rocket launchers could uh, disable a mech very easily, but that seems to have almost entirely escaped cannon now, and no one cares about infantry anymore. Um, no, we don't need infantry anymore. We've just got our big giant robots. Yeah, it's I was so good. disappointed when Mech Warrior Four ditched infantry. At least, at least well, in Mech okay. Warrior Three, they had them. <laughs> I think, but if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think MechWarrior 4 was built in like 18 months. Yes, it, it was. And they built uh, it off of like BattleTech battle pods. I think yes. that, or like, or like a recycled version of the MechWarrior 3 engine. Like it was, that game was barely holding together as is, and it's kind of a wonder that it got finished at all. Yeah, MechWarrior 4, um, it. It's less advanced than Mech Warrior 3, so I don't think it ran off a version of its engine because a different mm -hmm. studio handled it. But like instead yeah. of having 3D models for the infantry, they're just little sprites in the background that are like 10 yeah. pixels high. And... Yeah, it's just guys. a dude walking around. And if you get too <laughs> close to him, he starts running around in random directions. Yeah, yeah I remember I, that. I think that's cute, but I still miss being able to step on the guys and make them splatter into little <laughs> chunks and jibs. Well, yeah. trust me, you guys are lucky to have, like, any decent games in your preferred franchise, because the only game that ever came out for the Iron Kingdom setting was this fucking garbage fire of a turn-based strategy game. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you told me about Tactics. that. Yeah, oh, no. I, I backed the Kickstarter for that, and it was one of the biggest financial mistakes I have ever made. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> it was just the worst. <laughs> It, it did that thing that a lot of like poor adaptations do where it wasn't different enough to have its own identity, but it wasn't, it also wasn't a good adaptation of War Machine. Mm. So it ended up just being just the worst. And, uh, it, and to this day, it's practically unplayable on even like Alienware, Razor, Super Duper, MLG like rigs. Oh, because God, really? So, yeah, it's so poorly optimized. It'll go down to like 10 frames a second on like God PCs. Well, it's like, it's my guess there is it's Ugh. trying to render all the particle effects on the soundboard. Oh, Jesus. That sounds oh. about right. 
Of yeah. Course. Yeah. That 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 actually does sound like something because privateer press like. Oh, do you guys mind if I like briefly, uh, bitch just a little bit, just just a, a go taste ahead. of what I'm capable? No, of. go for Don't it. Worry. Like, I was bitching about MWO. Like, fair enough. Uh, I have so, not had enough salt today. Do it. <laughs> so, Privateer Press, the company that makes War Machine, is basically tabletop Sega, wherein when they first came onto the scene. They like flipped the table and changed the game completely and put out some of the coolest shit ever. So, like in the early 2000s, when GW had just gone through the 90s, where like their rules were just total garbage, uh, War Machine Mark One came out and it totally changed the game. Uh, and since then, they had some more good stuff happen. Uh, but just like Sega, once they essentially once they hit, how do I put this? Uh, in the same way where when Sega bumped up against 3D games, they like started making horrible ones. When uh, War Machine tried to ramp up into a much bigger non-skirmish game, that's when it it just turned into absolute dog shit. Like, uh, and I, I this is speaking of somebody who still plays it and buys the products, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but that's essentially the the through line for like whenever i talk about ig stuff the ip is really cool it's basically like talking about sonic the original ip is really cool there's a lot of cool writers on it a lot of the expanded universe stuff is really neat but the main company can't write to save their goddamn lives <laughs> that's about it yeah i'm looking at i'm looking at the models now these are dope as hell oh yeah uh like we like I could probably do a full episode, maybe a few, on like Warjacks and what I like about them, and like that's my whole giant robot uh, aficionado card is mostly based around Warjacks. Yeah, Warjacks are fucking cool, honestly. Yeah, uh, there are some winner designs and some not so great ones, uh, but they're they're neat because they're not piloted and they're also. They're like, like they're mecha Pokemon. Base, yeah, like kind of. Wait, really? Yeah, they're actual steam-powered autonomous robots. Right. Holy shit, this is awesome. And they have the same horrible drawbacks that like something would be made out of steam power. I, I don't know if it's the new rule books, but in the old second edition rule book, uh, under the war under like the Warjacks description page, it would be number of hours it can operate on a full tank. And it was like across the board, like eight hours if not in combat, forty-five minutes when in combat, like stuff oh, like shit. that. Like they're actually really inefficient, uh, which is another cool thing. Like you were talking about janky mech designs, I really like it when whatever the the de facto cool uh, like centerpiece model in a in a setting is, if it's has a lot of downsides, I think yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, I I love I like I'm looking up this, this concept art here and the image of like a one giant robot smashing another giant robot in the face while like belching fire and smoke from exhaust pipes on its back. That's so fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, I am Arjack. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, they can't talk. Uh, they have about the intelligence level of toddlers. They do actually. It's hilarious. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, four jacks are really cool. And uh, dub dub, uh, god damn it! Tell me your real name one more time. I don't want to call you dub dub. <laughs> uh, Dan works. Uh, Dan, uh, look up uh the ironclad war jack and nomad war jack side by side, because that's like. The other really cool thing is I play mercenaries, which is this weird sub faction in uh, okay, so War Machine. Ironclad. What was, what was the second one? Nomad. Nomad. And look at them, uh, and you'll notice like they're very similar looking. And the reason that I play uh, mercenaries as a faction is because mm. they don't have top of the line stuff. Basically, they're using army surplus from a hundred years ago they're using outdated designs that those are the only ones they can get a hold of so they always have shittier versions of ge generally signar jacks they have like worse versions all around 
Yeah, it's just whatever you can find. It's it's fine. Just set it in a battle. It's, it, it'll totally work. Yeah, kind of like Battletech, actually. Oh yeah. yeah, that's other similarity. I, from my limited research into Battletech, it seems like if the, there's like some sort of oh, underlying theme to the setting, it's that people are stupid and they can't stop fighting. <laughs> that's pretty I much mean, Battletech. I. It is a war game. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, uh, do you like war? <laughs> we uh, we we got war for you. We got we got we got uh we got a uh, uh, lots of, like fighting, and uh, dude, uh, we've we've got like seven centuries of war for you. You're gonna got, fucking got, love it. <laughs> hit, hit me up if you need a fix, bro. You know the one like, thing we got like big big robots doing fighting. Uh, you you like that, right? <laughs> dude, like holy shit, we've got like pure concentrated war here, dude. It, it's good shit. You know, oh, we got this. We got this thing where, where like every every like plotline or like thing, uh, like major event in the universe is like a thing that is per- like ultimately kind of a tragedy, and it could be could have been prevented if people had just taken like five minutes to sit down and talk to each other for a little bit. But no, we're just gonna punch each other in the face with giant robots because it's cooler. Look, we, we've got we've got the clan wars here, all right? We've got a fucking future interplanetary blitzkrieg, dude. This is the shit. This will get you high in two fucking minutes, dude. I, I'm only selling this for twenty dollars a gram, dude. That's fucking the shit. Uh, the other thing is that don't rat me out, dude. <laughs> while there are designs that are typically used by one faction in uh, BattleTech, it seems like most of the time people just grab whatever they can get as far as Mexico. So you'll see, yeah. Every design with every faction eventually. I mean, like it's it's kind of it's a little bit like uh, contemporary uh, sort of like warfield or battlefield settings that we have, like say in I don't know Syria, right? Where you have where you have like old ass like T thirty fours running running around next to like old American tanks, and some dudes showing up with like a Toyota Hilux that they've bolted a couple of iron plates onto. Like, right, that's, right. That's the aesthetic, but like in space. You see, the main, like the main theory, the main operational theory of the people in the Battletech universe is um, do the big yoink. <laughs> <laughs> that really does seem to be it. Pretty much. But like, I think one of the things that, one of the things that I really like about the Battletech universe, uh, it's like really, it's something that has come up at least like percolated in my brain a little bit more recently over the last like year or so is the fact that for the most part these mechs these machines are uh they're like old gods right like that's sort of like a little bit of how i sort of picture them in that yeah they'll follow your orders and go into battle with you but no at the end of the day this machine has been around for hundreds of years and it's probably going to still be around after you right this thing is older than you are and is greater than you are and when you die in this thing they're just going to wash you out of the cockpit and replace you with some with something else Dang. It's funny you said wash you out of the cockpit. That's literally the exact phrasing I had in my mind. Yeah. Like these machines eat people. Right. Yeah. Effectively. Yeah, that's that's really cool. It's kind of a mythos thing, you know. Yeah. My problem is that they just like they got away from it in the later <clears throat> lore for Battletech. Like in the early versions, like you said, like there's this stuff about how mech warriors are knights, they're elite warriors, and like these machines are centuries old, they're handed down like generation to generation, family to family. Mm-hmm. But like you get to like 3048 and like 3050 in the clan wars and stuff, and no, no, we're we're making mechs by like the fucking score now. We, yeah. We've got so many new mechs, we've got We've got extended range large lasers on these ones, so uh, those old family ones kind of suck now. GG. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> yeah, Battletech has a big pacing problem with its story. Basically, you know, the initial stuff up until 3025 or so took, you know, centuries, if not almost a full millennia, for everything to be established and to soak in. And so mm-hmm. the whole world could become vast and 
you could develop a whole bunch of lore and little details, but then, okay, the next time period is about 25 years later when the clan show up. Okay, how long does the clan lore last? Not even two years? That's really rushed. But then, yeah. instead of at least cooling things off and waiting another 25 years, immediately yeah. they start jumping into the Civil War and uh, Operation Bulldog and all that stuff, and then right into the Jihad, right until the, whatever it is, the blackout period just and it, it happens too fast and the world's you gotta let these things soak a bit let things yeah. develop i think i think if they let it happen any slower then they probably wouldn't be able to use like you know the, the same characters in multiple time periods it's like yeah for instance you've got like uh kyle lord Liel. like he you know if you took like 25 years to have the fedcom civil war happen after like the clan wars then kai would have been like a fucking yeah. you know like 50 years old or some shit what the well, fuck that's, dude that's an easy fix like we've already established that these clans are basically like feudal lords in a lot of ways and they have access to a lot of resources that they basically just gank off the peasants so couldn't you just add some like rejuvenate 40k style Rich people get to live longer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Can I can I can I handle this one? Sure. Go nuts. They could, and they would hate it. The, like, like the clans have set up their society in, a, in a, to the point where an old warrior is considered to be a shameful thing because you haven't died glori gloriously in combat yet. Yeah, they, they. I think it's in Blood of Kerensky. They sort of make a point about that. Like, there's an old man who's missing an eye. I think he's one of the Comstar people, like, oh, yeah, if uh, you were younger, we'd bother to replace your eye, but you're, you're mm -hmm. old, so whatever, just go die. On that, on that front, like, Inner Sphere for Life, like, that is, those are my people, the, 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 the FRR will rise again, and we will, we will take back whatever <laughs> was, was taken from us, we'll win that second football game, whatever. You're, you're, you're yeah. really giving but, me, like, uh, Zeon did nothing wrong vibes right now. Oh, no, no, the, the FRR, the Free Russell Hog Republic, was to my knowledge, the only functioning democracy oh. in the Battletech universe, and it lasted for about five years before being completely destroyed. Oh, you, by like, the clans. you want a dose of democracy, dude? Um, uh, sorry, uh, I'm fresh out of that, dude. I I've got to go back to my supplier. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, but like back to, back to the main point. Um, with like clans and just like being old, my like bar none, the absolute best character that I've read out of any like Battletech novel is Joanna from Jade Falcon, because she's like her entire thing is she is pissed, old, and like angry that she is both of those things, and no one is has been has so far like proven badass enough to kill her yet. So she just keeps getting angrier and angrier <laughs> as she gets older and older. It just keeps beating the shit out of everyone else. Woman too angry to die. Yeah, 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 she's she's too angry to die, and it's it's absolutely wonderful. She's so salty. I love it. <laughs> she used to go fight Doom guy. Yeah, <laughs> they cancel each other out. And like the, the like, she 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 like managed to get this old and become like this legendary warrior without ever actually winning uh, what's called a blood name, which is like the thing that all clan warriors strive for you don't earn you don't get a last name you have to earn it through this like series of uh like like a tournament name, arc yeah you have to like fight. what all true warriors strive for yeah and she has never actually won this thing despite being one of the greatest warriors her clan has ever produced and i love the contradiction there just didn't didn't get the good boy points like yeah she just had like bad luck every single run and eventually was, she was so old that no one wanted to sponsor her anymore so uh, she went off and like killed the most legendary warrior in the galaxy and people were like okay maybe you get a couple of lines in our history book <laughs> you get to be a footnote congratulations yeah all right <laughs> fine old woman we'll put you in the history books but don't expect anything too good all right you're too old you're you're a mech boomer. <laughs> yeah. And, and eventually she just gets relegated back to where she started, which was beating the shit out of trainees. And like apparently that's where her sunset years happen. Hi. It's, never, it's Hi. Never <laughs> Yeah. 
she, it's never specifically confirmed like where or how she dies to my knowledge so like i i like to imagine she's like she's still out there to this day just beating the shit out of fresh trainee is fresh off the bus Hi, yeah, just... we're the clans. Uh, we don't like boomers. You can only be a mech warrior guy if you're a zoomer. Uh, all boomers get out. Boomers can go watch um, Spherefeld. Spherefeld. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> that was uh, real bad. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Exile. But that's part of <laughs> why I. That's part of why I don't like uh, the jihad and dark age eras. Is because you know. You go from having all these characters and these stories that span their entire lives that are fairly detailed, and all of a sudden they all get fucking nuked. The planets yeah. they're on get literally blown up in some cases. Yeah. Everyone you know is probably dead. That's yeah. There weren't enough war crimes since the succession. <laughs> so they had to balance it out. Oh, they gotta fill a quota, yeah. That's fair. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have I've got a question for the folks that like uh have a little bit more like experience with the lore. Um what what was like the moment or what was like this particular story that made you realize that there was something like special going on here or like something particularly engaging about this universe? What was like the peak battle tech story for you? Um the peak Battletech story, it's kind of hard to say because, like, to be honest, I've never really been into MechWarrior for the lore so much, mm. you know, for the space politics and stuff. But I did read the Bullet Kerensky novels. I've got them in my bookcase right here. And those are some good fucking books, honestly. Yeah, for me, um, I... I was introduced to Battletech through Mac Warrior 2 when I was literally two years old, and I started playing it since uh, then. So there was never really uh, a moment that necessarily clicked. It was just, oh, this is a thing that's awesome. But uh, when I really started to get into it a bit more, uh, I'd already read the Blood of Kerensky novels, and I, that was the only time I'd ever experienced anything outside of... Uh, the video games, and I was still in like middle school, so I had no idea what the hell was going on. But mm -hmm. I finally came back to it with uh, Decision at Thunder Rift when I got asked to work on that uh, fan game a few years ago, and uh, I read it and I fell in love because uh, how much how much love was given to each mech. Because previously, in Blood of Kerensky and in video games, mechs were just like, you might as well have described, uh, there's a Stinger that's like an F-16, whatever, it's a cool-looking vehicle, let's go shoot things. But mm -hmm. in Thunder Rift, the first, actually the first Battletech novel, uh, each mech is given its own history, it takes its time, You're like, we only have one mech, there's literally seven mechs on the whole planet, and six of them are owned by the bad guys. Yeah. We have to find a way to make this work. And what do you get? A fucking locust. <laughs> Yeah, they did get a locust first, didn't they? Mm hmm Yeah, they got a locust, and I think they blew off the head of a stinger, so they yeah. had to take time to salvage that or something. Um, Decision at Thunder Rift is really an incredible book, especially for how like early it came in Battletech lore. Mm -hmm. I like it a lot, though I have to complain. Uh, spoilers for a book that's older than almost anyone listening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the ending me. fucking sucks. I, I love the book, but the ending is one of the most disappointing things I've ever I don't, read. I don't cool. You, you saved me the ending. I got to the point, I think, just after they had picked up the Locust, and for some reason, I just like never got back to reading it. It's, Thanks! I, I left on a high! Oh, well, basically, they go to Thunder Rift, which is what the book is named after, and they basically dip into the water to use the water to cool their mechs off. Uh, and they go to a big showdown with the guy that killed the guy's dad, and it looks like, oh, he's going to finally get his revenge. And it's this tense battle where characters you've spent the whole novel, you know, growing to know get killed off, and, you know, oh, it's going to be the final stand. There's the big bad guy robot, and he's with the, the duke uh, who uh, ordered the whole killing and everything, and they're going to fight, and then all of a sudden they go, hey... How about you just leave? And our heroes go, okay. They get on a dropship and leave. That's kind of it. 
and they don't get a revenge. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to start a long and storied mercenary career. It, it's there's a little more minutia to it. Like <laughs> they say, like oh, the this government is going to give you a paycheck if you just walk away because we want this planet. So our heroes are like, ah, eh, fuck this planet. Let's take the money and go. That's kind yeah. of it. I mean, they are mercenaries, but like I, I gotta say, like I really. I think there's some really great storytelling. Like, I think run away from planet is a great thing to put on a resume. All right. <laughs> there is a great reason why, like, there is a reason why the Great Death Legion is feared throughout the inner sphere. They are so good at running away from things. All right. It's <laughs> like they'll trample you as they're running away from things. So that, that's how they do it. Watch out. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think if someone's going to read it, they should almost start with the second book in the Grey Death trilogy, because it starts, they're on that same dropship, but they basically hire a bunch of random mercenaries uh, at a, whatever mercenary planet. It might be Outreach. Uh, or not Outreach, the other one that I can't remember. Um, but Troll one, I think? That might be it. Uh, they, they get their dropship shot out from under them, and like half the cast get killed like instantly. It's almost like a slasher movie because you get introduced to a dozen characters and they never introduce more characters. So you spend the whole novel just getting to know them a bit more. And uh, I just prefer stories like that. Yeah. I mean, just speaking of like cowardly mercenaries and just running away from running away from your contracts, that basically is how the uh, the FRR won to quote won its War of Independence. No, they, yeah. they made they made a budget contract with mercenaries that ascribed to the Grey Death Legion business model. Running away, man! It's running really away. Profitable. Run and live, man. Yeah. I'm okay. Just... So can can I can I can I make a confession here? Sure. I think probably for the first the first time admitting like as far as. Uh, I mean, like it's it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of no 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 no. Hear me out on this one. Mech assault is kind of like. Wolfenstein in the Battletech universe, in the same way that the old cartoon was like a propaganda movie. Now, huh. it's yeah. like it's like Mechasol is like the arcade version of real history within the Battletech universe. Huh, that's huh. a pretty cool way of looking. That's at sort it. of that's sort of how that's sort of how I see yeah. it. But like here, I'm gonna here's 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 the confession, guys. I've never actually played a round of tabletop Battletech in my life. Hey, that's we're fun. in the same ah. boat. I've never played it either. I came to this universe starting off from the books and from MechWarrior 4. And I came to I came to the books like really late too. I came in at like the the midpoint of the Fedcom Civil War with I think Endgame was the second book I'd ever picked up and that was like the last book in the official like run of BattleTech novels. Hmm. Um but hmm. the thing the moment of the lore the like the moment of the BattleTech story that got me um was in the book i think it's called shadows of war this was part of the twilight of the clan series right so the twilight of the clans is basically like the inner sphere essentially decides to put up, put aside their differences for the most part and decide to bloody the clan's noses in order to like stop their invasion um and in order to do that they per they, they pick like the most violent clan the clan that the clan that did the most war crimes in in operation revival um they like nuked a city from orbit because someone i don't know insulted their honor or whatever sick uh, yeah so so the entire inner spirit like decided to like gang up and go those guys fuck those guys and so at the say at the same time they united on the front and drove this clan clan smoke jaguar out of the inner spheres through their own invasion corridor just like grinding them uh out of their like out of the galaxy the known galaxy while sending a separate task force secretly to the clan homeworld to invade the smoke jaguar's homeworld of huntress right and mm. that task force uh, was called task force serpent it was a collection of like a couple of house units mostly mercenaries mostly like elite mercenaries it was the largest invasion force in human history like the best people the most people the best ships the best mechs the best equipment all of the logistics of the entire of like 
most of human space went into this endeavor. And in the book previous to this, uh, I think it was like uh, Sword and Fire, uh, Task Force Serpent lands on Huntress and basically wins the initial fight for the planet, right? The next book, this is the one I'm talking about, Shadows of War, is the remnants of the Smoke Jaguar garrison unit who were not supposed to be facing frontline combat. You are you if you are if you're a clanner and you're posted on your home world, it's supposed to be like uh uh like it's, it's not a position of honor because you should be out dying at the front because why would you want to be staying back here and guarding like our genetic repository, you fucking boomer. Right. So <laughs> Task Force Serpent has to then basically root out uh, and battle down, like grind down this like guerrilla faction of Smoke Jaguar loyalists on their own planet, right? And the the story is basically this like back and forth boxing match between these two factions, like maneuvering around each other and just slogging it out and like sort of like face to face, like really down in the dirt, down in the mud and blood combat of it. And about two-thirds into the book, the head of Task Force Serpent, uh, General Ariana Winston, who's just this, like, she's supposed to be this, this elite mercenary commander, right? Uh, she hasn't slept in days. And she is currently getting a briefing about, like, the the smoke jaguars movements uh they're like descending into like some swamp or whatever it's been a while since i read the book i might be like mixing up details of the plot here but the thing that stuck out to me is she like reaches for a cup and she takes a sip of coffee and she realizes it's decaf and she asks or she realizes it's either decaf or it's like fake coffee and she asks like why can can i have some real coffee we're out the most well-equipped, well-funded, well-staffed invasion force, the, like the biggest mustering of manpower and technology in the history of the inner sphere up until this point. And it is grinding down on this planet to the point where they are out of ammunition and coffee. Wow. And oh, shit, moment, dude, not the coffee, dude. Yeah, that <laughs> moment was so good because everyone is just so fucking Fuck. tired by the end of it right they're just exhausted and they keep having to get up and try to put the other guy down and then you can like no one can ever quite do it and it's mm, it's just like a mud wrestling match between giant robots i'll have to God, read that dude, one like, that sounds really interesting you gotta, you gotta pour one out for the coffee <laughs> yeah. I, I i actually have a question for everybody here sure and that is like what is the most recent giant robot -y thing you guys have kind of ingested fully lately like franchise um, doesn't matter what franchise or whatever like a book a show whatever i fuck i i, I played custom robo <laughs> what is that it's a uh, a gamecube game and uh there's these little like three foot tall robots in cubes and they fight in like holographic arenas like it's not even really a giant robot thing it's a fucking like Yu-Gi-Oh anime type thing. Well, it's that's a video cool. game. Yeah, it actually is cool. It's cooler than it looks. Uh, what about you, Kilroy? Ah, uh, well, I gotta be honest. I'm not that familiar with too many other mech things. I did start playing uh, Mech Mercenary Company, uh, which is an indie game that's in development. It's still in early access. It looks very promising, but almost none of the lore is written. It's basically Mech Warrior Two plus Mech Warrior Four and kind of a mishmash. That, so uh, it's just like we're we're sick of waiting for the best version of this game to come out. We're gonna make it ourselves. That's sort what. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's very very promising. It's made in Unity. Um, there's not too much. The mech, the game's already got like twenty two mechs and like fifteen or so vehicles you can fight. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of it. It's basically just an open arena, and you, you go shoot things uh, for a bit. But uh, I think in another year, it would be a very promising uh, game, a little world. Yeah, and like it looks, it, it looks like 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 a small indie game. But it it from the videos that I've seen, it it looks like it plays really well and it feels really good. Yeah, that's like that's the most important bit. So. 
Yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. The, the way the mechs control are very good. The only suggestion I even have on that front is um, having like a, a key to uh, make the mechs break. Because like in Mech War Online, you have a key that'll bring your mech to a full stop. Because uh, the game controls essentially in the same way. Huh. That's one thing it's lacking. You just have to manually throttle down, which with a keyboard is kind of awkward. All right. Uh, and Mark, you said your name was? Sorry. I, I'm goddamn terrible with names. Uh, Mr. Dub Dub. Uh, Dan. Dub Dan. Dan. God Dan. damn it. That's not even close. <laughs> you, you missed the mark. Uh, I don't know. He, he sounds like a mark. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> what about you? What's the last kind of mech related thing you, you've ingested? Um, can I delve into anime bullshit? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Go nuts. Okay. Okay. So it's actually not an anime, but like it definitely traffics in anime bullshit. Um, there's this podcast, an actual play podcast, like an RPG podcast called Friends at the Table, right? Okay. Um, right on. It's like their their pitch is uh. Their, their their pitch is that they are a an RPG podcast focused on smart characterization, um, critical world building, and fun interaction between good friends. That, that's based. I think that's what what their okay. pitch is. Sounds um, Yeah, uh, their 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 host sounds a little bit like Ira Glass. If any, if anyone's an NPR nerd, um, <laughs> and so. They recently finished up an arc that I'm, I don't know, maybe a third of the way through called uh, The Twilight Mirage, which is set originally in the Fate system, but then they moved on to Scum and Villainy. Uh, so it was like a, a hack of a Star Wars game huh. um, in which in the distant, distant, like uh, advanced technology becomes magic future. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a fleet of, uh, a, like a traveling fleet of nomadic uh, colony ships that roam the galaxy, and each individual ship is sort of administered and ruled, ruled or governed by what was called a divine, which is, in their in like in that universe was, the the apotheosis of a an artificial intelligence that reaches the point not only of self-awareness, but to the point where it is, it is able to process and deliver information to the level where it essentially becomes some sort of deity, it becomes some sort of god, right? And mm -hmm. this faction is actually sort of like exiled from the rest of society. And they sort of like live with their divines and each individual ship is that has basically been designed by one of these players, right? And in, in episode zero, it was, they have, um, what is your character? What is your character's background? What is their, all of their like personalities? What ship are they from? What is that ship like, right? Um, what, describe your particular divine and what they do and what they give to the, the rest of their, like the rest of the nomad fleet, the rest of the rest of the twilight mirage. And the last question that the DM asked each player in the, like the player creation episode was how did your divine die? Ooh, rough. Mm. Fucking rough. Because, because it is uh oh time and all of the divines are dying and the fleet is slowly collapsing around them. And it's up to the players to try to, figure out how to stop it dang yeah and like you like ridiculous giant robots made out of like space junk and like that one that one uh zaku from uh ba -ba 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 -da -da. what's 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 the the, the gundam one that's like entirely focused around jazz the movie what I, there's, I don't know. <laughs> there's like there's like one of the, one of the one of the Gundam movies is like one of the characters is incredibly obsessed with jazz and he like plays it constantly while he's in battle and one of those mechs is like has iron plates that it can like move around its body to like block things all over the place and like that was one of the divines is it like blocked incoming attacks by physically moving parts of itself parts of the ship in order like in 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 the way of like enemy fire and it was slowly like being broken down. And that's sort of like how it went. Um, one of the divines just, it got curious curious about something and it just left. 
<laughs> and the, its its followers are like, where the fuck did it go? And we need to find it. And so their entire thing is they're like chasing down this old god and like it's left little clues scattered around the galaxy. But the way oh, wow. uh, a machine god thinks is different from us. So like the things that it that it takes interest in are different than us. And the fundamental question that is like proposed there is what could be so interesting as to cause a machine god to abandon its people? And some of the things that, that are set out on this, on this way is like, here's an, a giant ancient treasure chest, or here's a, a particularly like badass constellation, or here's like two neutron stars that are orbiting around each other. And at the same time, like, here's a nice cliff. You know, it's just, it's just it's, it's a pretty it's cliff. It's like some, nice. some like Dr. Manhattan shit where he's like, I like, I like this area because it has lots of sand. And yeah. I will stare at the sand for the next three millennia. Yeah. I yeah, so like it's... <laughs> somebody needs to take that thing away from you. So yeah, that's that's a uh, that's the thing that has like grabbed my attention the most recently. Well, definitely sounds interesting. Mechs and shit. Yeah, that sounds cool. Friends at the table with host Austin Walker. That's it. Mm, Such nice. a good show. So check it out. Yeah. Uh, well, what, is, is it, it's like does anyone have does anyone here play like? rpgs role-playing games things like that i've yeah. wanted to but i have no <laughs> me, friends me, me. <laughs> okay 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 here's here's a fun trick that they they did in character creation that you should either use yourself or give to your players you give your players something that are called beliefs beliefs are actionable um ideologies that your character holds and if you act upon them you can like gain bonuses for them for instance one of the characters and friends at the table in the Twilight Mirage, uh, from the divine that was like using its its iron shields to block everything, her specific belief is: I will never uh, leave someone in a situation that will inevitably lead to their death. And so the DM's like, "Okay, cool. Here's a person that is who is in a situation that will lead to their inevitably to their death. Oh, by the way, the rest of the universe is exploding, and the last living divine is actively dying about 200 feet that way. What do you do? <laughs> oh, oh no, wow, kind of forcing the issue there, eh? Yeah, especially if you can get two beliefs that like conflict with one another. Mm, so good, so good for drama. Yeah, kind of a trolley problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. It's yeah. absolutely that. Yeah." Uh, on my end, like uh, the last thing I I did, robot giant robot related was uh, I watched. Uh, it was just a straight up Gundam. I watched uh, War in the Pocket for like the fourth time. Uh, I watch War in the Pocket like no joke, like every six months. It's like oh, what's one in of those... the pocket? What are they fighting over? <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those shows where. At least, like these are rare for most people, but like you can just keep coming back to it, like all the time without any. It never gets old to you. And for me, that that's War in the Pocket, which I don't know. I know uh, Peter and I, Mister Raccoon over there, actually watched it with me one time, so I know he's seen it. But I I, I don't know about anybody else. Uh, not yet. Listen, listen. There's small children in the pocket. That's what they're fighting over. <laughs> they're, they're, fighting they're fighting over, over a bit of custody. <laughs> they're fighting over a bit of land and a long forgotten 20. I uh yeah, I want to do like at some point like a whole podcast on War in the Pocket. Like there's enough material to cover. Uh it's a six episode OVA. It was made in 89 as the 10th year anniversary for Gundam. Uh and it's really like it lacks a most of the, oh, look at the cool robots uh, of like 98% of all other Gundam series. It's basically just a war tragedy. Like, mm. uh, yeah, there's the, like two mobile suits in there, really. There's or three. There are like technically four <clears throat> fights, and all of the fights look fucking amazing. Like, they have a ton of money poured into them. Mm -hmm. And it's 80s, so none of it's computer generated. And it's all like you can see every gut every tube, every gear, and, like, yeah. every uh, robot that's on screen. Well, let me see the tubes! <laughs> Pretty much. It looks great. Um, it's also mostly from the perspective of Xeon, which is not very common in those mm. series. Uh, but it's it's really, really good. That's another recommendation for me, is War in the Pocket. You can find the sub just floating around on YouTube. I would recommend the dub if you can find it. 
in, in a completely legal way, of course, that will in, in no way uh, impugn my character by your accessing of it. Of yeah, course. It's, it's all hypothetical. Yeah. It's in Minecraft. We only do legal <laughs> things here on the forecast, all right? But the, the dub is really good. Uh, and uh, I, I if I talk about it like any more, really, I'll spoil it, which is like a bummer because it's really good. So just go watch War in the Pocket. Fair. All right. That's fair enough. Uh, Find out what is in the pocket. This is true. <laughs> Well, what, what what could be so interesting that it causes a machine god to disappear into a pocket? That's, that's definitely it's, the uh, question of the week. Pocket. The reason that okay. it's called War in the Pocket is like a meta commentary of sorts, but yeah. whatever. Just watch it. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the note of just like really, really nice mecha animations. Pockets. Yeah, with pockets. Um, what is... <laughs> What is like everyone's like favorite example of like just like really solidly done giant robot animation, either in like games or films, media, whatever? Like, what was what was the point where it's like, yeah, that is a that is a two story building and it is running at me? Yeah, uh, honestly, I'd say uh, not to sound like a broken record here, but the fight scenes that are in War in the Pocket mm -hmm. are like. The the weird thing about Gundam is that they go out of their way to basically show that the robots are lighter than they look and mm -hmm. almost kind of float around uh, even when they're not in space. Yeah, they're really zippy most of the time. Right. But in, in War in the Pocket, like, they do... You know how, like, most uh, big gundam uh fight scenes have... A like, million missiles flying around everywhere and laser well, beams. They have typical uh, anime pacing. Where there's mm -hmm. like a lot of jobbers getting blown up, but uh, the the main characters have plot armor, and even if they're going to die, they're going to be a cool guy and then die, right? Mm -hmm. And War in the Pocket, the fight scenes in that, everybody's a jobber. There's no plot armor. You mm -hmm. just get fucking gatted. Like, there's, oh, this Federation mobile suit team is going to uh, jump down from a nearby ship onto this colony. They've got two gun, it's like they had two gun cannons and a bunch of GMs. And one goth just nukes all of them before they can even touch down. Because they're really vulnerable because they're just kind of floating down slowly. Nothing that happens in the pocket leaves the pocket, kid. <laughs> <laughs> they were trying to leave the pocket. We can't have that. We can't have them see outside. This is Plato's pocket. So I'd say it's less like weight because, you know, it's floaty. But mm -hmm. it does floaty really well. It makes you yeah. feel like they're kind of... It gives you a good sense of their presence, I guess. Okay. I don't know if I have a good example of anything like that, honestly. Uh, uh, the, the one thing that I sort of love that uh, gives a lot of weight to mechs that made me sort of appreciate the scale of mechs is actually War of the Worlds. And mm. it's not a visual medium, it's a book. So, you know, that doesn't really answer your question, but... I just appreciated the uh, very detailed descriptions of people literally being, you know, the size of ants, just completely unable to affect the uh, giant war machines trying to murder them. Right. Just yeah. trying to exist, but unable to do anything, but just sort of accept their fate. Real, real anti-colonial hours have begun, yes. <laughs> the HMS Thunderchild fired its guns at the tripods. Its captain... Reached inside of his pocket. He found a Gundam inside. <laughs> <laughs> he found an entire war and he threw it at the aliens. Oh, God. You know, I was going to make an animation about the Thunder Child fighting uh, the tripods, but I couldn't do water right. Well, I seem to recall in the book, it fires a couple volleys, it kills one, and then it dies. Like... Yeah, pretty much. But, you know, I can stretch that out to two minutes. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Ooh, they're giant robots. They take a while to put down. Yeah. Uh, hey, there's a really heat rays, bro. There's <laughs> a really, really good um, comic. Uh, it's a one-off. It's just one comic, uh, done by this one guy. I'm sure if you look it up, like it's a war, uh, war of the Worlds comic, and it's the immediate fallout. It's it's like ten years later, and essentially, uh, Britain has reverse engineered uh, all of the Martians' tech and is now uh, taking over the entire planet. Yeah, that's actually a movie. Um, they they made one a few years ago. It's trash, and I love it. 
Uh, that's unfortunate. I don't know if it's like adapted from the same thing, but if it is Garbo, uh, that that really is unfortunate because the the comic is super good. Oh, uh, is it? Does the comic have Teddy Roosevelt? Uh, I don't remember. I read it so many years ago. It's got like a mostly orange color palette, so it's really weird looking. Uh, uh, but like, there are cars, but all of them have spider legs because they got them from Martian tech. I like, think that's in the movie. Yeah. That that is probably based off of that comic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am sorry to hear that it's Garbo. Oh, it, it's it's really very cheap, but I honestly enjoyed watching it so much. Just as someone that grew up reading mm-hmm. War of the Worlds and who likes giant robots, because they put a, it's all almost all traditionally animated besides the robots. Uh, mm-hmm. And the humans have reverse engineered their own tripods, which are kind of cute. Um, and the aliens finish their uh, flying machines from the end of the book. Uh, so there's air battles as well. Um, and every, every human that gets hit by the ray gun, they lovingly detail them disintegrating. It's, it's great. I love it. Real talk, Look out, Martha! I... My Ford Prefect is going to step over you! I really <laughs> do love the... It's the definitely tendency. Thursdays. Like, I know that this is kind of tropey and to some extent, like, power fantasy-esque, but I really do like the tropes where humanity just, like, fucking finesses whatever alien they're going up against. Like, they just totally trick them. They, they freak their beans. They, they, they outmaneuver them, even though they're, like, otherwise completely outgunned. The bacteria outmaneuvered the Martians. <laughs> well, like, what was, what was, what was the, the, the thing? It was like... Uh... Sir, we, we we're we're up against this this genetically bred warlord who we, we can't beat Khan. We'll never be able to outmaneuver him. Have you tried going up? Yeah, that was really stupid. I I don't care if like that movie is considered really good. The idea of some some genius war commander bad guy just forgetting about the third dimension is really stupid. See, I actually kind of oh. buy it for this reason. Uh Say like uh, in the Expanse, right? In the in the the, the sci-fi epic, the Expanse, uh, we have Martians who are trying to colonize their planet, who have never, they've literally never lived um, in a, an environment in which they can't immediately see the end of their surroundings, right? So mm. they're, it's either the end of their agri, like their ag dome, or like the space helmet that they're wearing when they have to go outside. So the first time one of these Martian characters gets to Earth. And she sees a horizon, like she sees an ocean, and she sees the edge of the world. Like her brain kind of malfunctions, and she can't walk for a few minutes. Like it's totally outside of her realm of perspective. Like so, it's like just super extreme agoraphobia, essentially. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so like I I do I do kind of kind of get it. it's it's it feels like a cheap move, especially on like a writing thing, especially for someone that's supposed to be so smart, but. I don't know. I feel yeah, like I, think... I feel like if I was doing that, it would be like someone is using colors that I have never seen before and is now painting with them, mm. and they're kicking my ass with it. Right. Yeah. I think the idea is that like Khan was like a ground commander in mm. like the eugenics wars or whatever, and but he was never a spaceship captain, so he's like, let my spaceship forwards. That yeah. will stop Captain Kirk. Yeah, yeah, I always kind of saw it as... he doesn't realize a... that Captain Kirk is above hmm. or below. <laughs> the, yeah. reason, the reason why it's so hard to, to for uh, like uh, World War II Germany to strategize against the Americans is that you'd have to assume the Americans have a coherent strategy in the first place. Yeah. Checkmate, <laughs> Nazis! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I sort of always saw Khan as being so overconfident and greedy and vengeful yeah. that he just doesn't really listen to his own better sense. Yeah, it's a, it's also like it's like a like a, a highly classically trained musician mm. uh, who runs into someone who like is an absolute rookie, and they're doing things with a violin that the classically trained musician like hadn't even considered as a possibility, right? right. Because no yeah. one told them no. So that's a fun dynamic. I want I want to see what I want to see now is like a buddy cop story of that where someone who's like incredibly competent at their own thing and another person who is also like gets the job done but does it in like an orthodox way speaking of that in star trek have you uh heard of the alternative solutions to the uh, 
Kobayashi Maru test? No. Uh, so basically, Kirk's famous for having cheated, and he right. just you know rigs the whole simulation. But there are two other people that uh, won the like Kobayashi legit, Maru, uh, and one was a Klingon, and his solution was instead of going into enemy territory to rescue another ship, he just shoots the ship and blows it up and flies away. And now he doesn't risk interstellar war, and he lets those people die a graceful death because they get blown up. Well, and the other one, well. the other one's a Ferengi. So, like, doesn't the Klingon guy figure that's a trap? So he blows it up. Yeah, yeah. And then the the final one's a Ferengi that shows up, and he tries to barter with the Klingons, and they no one programmed a solution, so the simulation shuts down because it doesn't know what to think. <laughs> wow. That would be so easy. Just like basically have the Klingon scream at them and then shoot at them. Like that seems like it'd be pretty easy to program if you were like a holodeck aficionado. It's funny. So I'll let it slide. I will give you twenty bars of gold pressed latinum. Yeah, that's like people's lives. That's like that's like the perfect example of like you can have all the quality testers that you want for your software, but as soon as you release it into the actual public, that's when the real beta starts. Yeah. <laughs> They will find shit to break that you hadn't even dreamed of. All right, listen, MacWar Online, I'll, I'll give you three slips of latinum if you let me pass through this wall and attack the enemy on the other side. Well, clearly, the, clearly the way that you actually win the Kobayashi Maru test is one, instead of a spaceship, bring a kit fox, and two, put the entire simulation in your pocket and just take it home with you. I like the way you think. No, you pull a war out of the pocket. <laughs> you pull an entire war. Out. Yeah, suddenly you have a you have a fleet. Yeah. That works. <laughs> now I'm just picturing Kit Fox is flying through space. Podcast in the pocket, episode one. I am your host, Peter. This is Dan. This is my friend Ian, and this is my friend Ethan. <laughs> Today we'll be talking about putting things in your pockets, like war and <laughs> star destroyers. <laughs> And battleships. It's oh. a pocket battleship. That's why you call it that. No, no. We, we have to get a pocket fox. Uh, yeah. You put a kit fox miniature in your pocket, and then you just throw it. No, wait. Mm. Pocket sand. <laughs> okay, we're com we've completely lost the plot. Yes, we, we have. I don't know what we were talking about. We somehow yeah. careened from talking about our favorite mechs to this. Yeah. Well, I was um, thinking specifically, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, Kilroy, you can uh, speak a little bit more onto this. Um, what what do you sort of use as your inspiration? I guess I don't like to use that word, or like your reference, the thing that you go back to when you're like, I want mechs to feel like this when they move. You know? Uh well. I try to do a hybrid of everything. I, I don't have a singular reference uh, because I don't think there's really a perfect one. No, there really um, isn't. Mech Warrior 3 might be the closest, but even then it's it's a little dated and clunky and doesn't have quite as much weight as I'd like. But you yeah. go in, in like a... Mech, mechs are very difficult to animate because when it moves, you want to, you expect it as a viewer to move like a person, a giant metal person. And you think they're going to have a certain amount of sway and bounce, and they're going to move very organically, like a metal man. But then you have to remember, oh, there's a person sitting in there. If they move back and forth too fast, they're going to get fucking pulverized. Yeah. So yeah. you have to tone it down a little bit. And then you go, no, that's it's you, toned down too much. That's why you need to take a, a page out of the uh, Power Rangers book, where you just get an entire ass office building inside uh, the robot to sit in. Yeah, <laughs> that, that works. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 a balancing act because if you tone it down so much that yeah, a person could, uh, uh, theoretically uh, comfortably sit inside the cockpit as it's walking along, people are going to go, "Hey, it, why isn't that thing's upper torso moving? Why is the head weirdly stationary?" Yeah, and, and I kind of go with um, the Mech Warrior Two logic, and I, I sort of. Uh, uh, I'm, I mix Mech Warrior 2 and Thunder Rift, where in Thunder Rift, uh, there's no windshield, uh, and the cockpits are, are relatively voluminous, like you're on a, a sort of crash couch where when the uh, mech moves, there's sort of a bit of 
sway, so the seat absorbs a bunch of the uh, yeah, jock. it's like I'm kind of stabilized. Yeah, yeah, but uh, <laughs> basically the cockpit that you see is not even a true representation of the cockpit itself because you're seeing a view screen, not a windshield, so you can technically see out of parts of the mechs thanks to cameras all over the inside of the mechs, and that can yeah. let you sort of cheat a little bit with the inside, and maybe the mechs a bit roomier, maybe there's kind better like equipment them, inside. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's something you just kind of have to ignore, because that, that's something that I I want to imagine myself inside it in a way that's realistic. Mac Warrior 4 does it the worst in the whole series, because they just have a walking animation for every mech that gets sped up, so you you always have the mech ha mechs always have one foot on the ground except for like the mad cat which they bothered to animate a run cycle for and okay but the mad cat's run cycle cycle is goddamn beautiful yeah it's it's great in that game and, and technically the same for the vulture the mad cat is goddamn beautiful so i'm yeah, curious it's planner scum but whatever as somebody who hasn't played like a ton no i haven't played any of the uh mecha sorry the name of the series you're talking about where it's like a strategy game first and foremost uh, Battletech. I, well, Battletech. Yeah. Like, I I haven't played any of kind of I've only played the arcadey versions, the third person shooter essentially versions. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know, like, why is the quality between these sequels so fluctuating? Like, uh, different companies working on different time schedules in different uh, engines with like different bits of moving parts all over the place. Ah. And uh, a nice dose of development hell. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of like Heroes of Might and Magic, almost. Yeah. Where, like those uh, strategy games that, like, every single one of them was just an entirely different beast. Yeah, and, like, imagine on top of, uh, on top of all of the normal difficulties that you, that you get with game development, um, the source material that you're using also comes with about a floor-to-ceiling stack of legal bullshit yes. in order, that you have to like wade through in order to get to the point where you are allowed to make a game. Right. Yes, uh, particularly the games, MechWarrior 4 in particular, they created almost all of those uh, designs for that particular game first. Uh, <laughs> they, they put a bunch of that in like the MacPod stuff. But instead of just going back and saying, hey, let's figure out which, which designs we can legally use, they just said, fuck that. Let's make entirely new designs, except for like these five iconic machines, like the Atlas. That Mad we're Cat. absolutely certain we have the rights to. Yeah. And for I the mean, most part, they just knew new stuff. Like the Hellhound is one of them they completely redesigned. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's just a different mech. Yeah, Why? It, because you don't speak of Clan Wolverine. It's fine. Yeah. Another example I mean, of a kind of functioning democracy completely crushed by the universe that is Battletech. Yeah. I feel like I actually appreciate them more for by like, making new mechs and stuff because like to be perfectly honest, I'm getting tired of like Water and the Warhammer and mm -hmm. like all the other old unseen stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Battletech. There are some like there are some really pretty good designs from, like, the MechWarrior 4 stuff. I like the Argus. The Argus is great, but I can't ever touch it because it in Mercenaries, it, it's, it's the only heavy mech you can get for, like, 12 missions. And so I, I just got sick of seeing it on every single playthrough, even though I love the design. Because it's like, get out of yeah. here, Argus. I've seen you a billion times. I'm sick of you. Yeah. I don't want to see you again. Great. Heavy mechs. The Uziel yeah. is great. Uziel's the best. The way that they built the leg for that thing, that like three three jointed system that they have, like mm, so yeah, that's that's you know the, the icon cool? of Mech Warrior Four, I think. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Speaking of beautiful run cycles, like oh, can we give the Nova Cat a little bit of credit here? Oh yeah, it's very bouncy and fun. It's not even yeah, that great of a looking cool. design, but its animation is so good. It's so good. Okay, like the like. I do, like I do come back to Mech. Yeah. Yes, I hear that. I like I do come back to <laughs> Mech Warrior Four as far as the like the animation goes. As like that was my entry into the series, and that's sort of my basis on like how like that in the books is my basis for, on how these machines move. And like I think the Osiris 
the Nova Cat, the Mad Cat, and the the Daishi up at that up at that 100 ton range. That like slow, confident, swaying step. That like that 100 yes. ton swagger. You know, yeah. the Osiris is is my favorite. So I, I think I'm glad you you mentioned that. The Osiris, and then later on in Mercenaries, the Flea, when they just like tacked new mechs onto the old mech skeletons. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the Flea's adorable. Yeah. I, I love the Flea. It's so cute. That's another I mech they completely redesigned. Shit chicken walkers, they're so good. Yeah. Yeah, the Flea has even more ATSC energy than the, the Locust. Oh yeah, just the, the Flea's just like a, it's just a box on legs. <laughs> <laughs> run, run fast. I am yeah. fleet. Run fast. Run, 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 run. Shit, 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 shit. Run, 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 run. Shit, 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 shit. Go, 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 Yeah. The one thing. Like, mm -hmm. like the. Like that's, that's like part of my basis on like what I reference or like have that sort of image in my head when I'm trying to like make one of, one of my own mechs move. And the other one that I tried, like, the the weight scale changes between mechs, meaning that the movement is going to change between them, meaning that each mech is going to have its own particular personality in the way that it moves. Um, and so, like, the, the light mechs are going to be, like, really fast and really skittish. And I kind of, I, I, I know my, my, my dedicated haters of the YouTube comment section are going to, continue to roast me on this one but i do kind of feel like medium mechs move a little bit more humanoid like than you would you would necessarily expect them to but then as things get larger and larger uh the general reference that i go to is actually not robots at all it is 2014's godzilla <laughs> yeah i can see that because because like sure. these, these machines are described in the books as these godlike avatars of war who are able to like level city blocks with a with a volley from their their gigantic cannons right well, right because there's got to be a reason to use them instead of the much right. lower profile tanks or something and then and then specifically the movement of the mechs in BattleTech are based off of Myamer bundles based off of artificial musculature my argument on this on this front is that an artificial musculature is going to lend itself a little bit more to like a naturalistic movement than you would necessarily expect it to now the 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 trouble is you don't want it to look specifically like a person moving around you want it to feel like a monster walking through a building and just like completely uh, like leveling the one on the other side in thunder and fire right it's a battleship with legs when you get into the, like the top scale things and one day i hope to be able to like really depict that the way it's like showing up in my brain mm -hmm. yeah boom, boom, i can see that boom. yeah um, like they're old angry gods you know hmm. now i'm tempted to do something like just make a little animation of like a dire wolf or daishi stepping through a building just literally walking through it like it's nothing yeah and they would they're totally able to do that too which is I, that's the thing that that really really gets me is what when, when you have when you depict the sheer magnitude of any sort of large living or pseudo living character on on screen like every time you're able to, able to nail that weight and get that impact like mm, bread and butter yeah though though about your, you know, YouTube haters and how uh, your animations, you, you, you flavor them in your own particular way. You'll, you'll always get that, regardless of how well oh, you yeah. do. So essentially, you know, just, just take, take that as ad advice. You know, yeah. pick out the things that, uh, pick out the valid criticism and just kind of ignore the rest. Because pe people will give you bit for the dumbest of reasons. So, you know. Oh, oh yeah. Exactly. I will get angry at you. But yeah, like I, my most common comments, is I get shit like, uh, 
Oh, you're, you're clearly a, a, a Inner Sphere favoritist. That's why you always let the Inner Sphere win. And then I'll get like, oh, you're clearly a clan favoritist. You always let the clan yeah. win. Like, guys, mm -hmm. I've almost tossed what? a coin for every video. You watch my stuff. I almost always let the other side win. Because I, yeah. I think uh, part of mm -hmm. what, you know, when you're making an animation, it's important to sort of not know who's going to come out on top. That sort of creates a bit yeah, of gotta tension. Yeah, you got to get some, like, dramatic tension. Who knew? Yeah, so oftentimes I'll start an animation and Wait, not know who's going to win. What's that? No. I think it's dramatic like, tension it, is a type of breakfast cereal or something. <laughs> and dramatic, dramatic tension is the opposite of setting up a show like One Punch Man and like then not building up the villains first. <laughs> yeah, no, like, I think it's like a, some type of crunchy thing that comes in boxes, dude. I, I don't know about this. Yeah. Hmm. I think the most the most common vitriol the most vitriolic complaints that i've gotten is the mechs are too big they're moving too fast they're sliding around all over the place this is bullshit um yeah. and a couple of those a couple I, a couple of those i do get especially on the older ones uh like before i started doing things in blender um things like things things were i didn't i wasn't able to draw that many frames sorry guys <laughs> you yeah. can either make this look smooth or look like a storyboard i it's like big heavy mech fights takes a lot of, like it's it's very work intensive oh, especially God, yeah. like on that particular like medium i'm trying to get better i'm trying to like find find a medium i'm working on it guys we'll get there the second one that i still find hilarious is the people complaining about the the dude drawing a katana in the mech warrior revival trailer oh god oh my god the amount of shit that i have gotten for that like one, there's like that that crowd of like BattleTech grognards that are like, oh, I pr I probably I'm digging my hole now. Oh well, well, they're grognards. Like, there's, oh there's, 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 fucking god, yeah. cannot. That's yeah, fine. We Dig the we hole. Can't, fuck we can't have we can't have uh, we can't have like anime bullshit in our tabletop <laughs> game that lifted anime designs. Yeah, Blood of Kerensky. Literally, the guy pulls out a fucking katana and kills the yeah. elemental with it. But, yeah, like, like, but like, there's that fucking like, House Karita, dude. Like, samurai are their whole thing. Yeah, and like, like no this, shit, they're gonna have katanas. And this dude specifically was like supposed to be like a yakuza agent that was sent to this particular outworld in the FRR to try to like undermine the the local government there, but ends up being on the like the business end of the clan invasion and ends up having to like help the rebels beat off clan Ghost Bear. That didn't sound right. <laughs> you know, to get, get kick clan Ghost Bear off of their planet, um, like that. But oh my fucking god, katana! <laughs> Oh, but like that was that was the first one. The second bit was like this guy's gonna tr this guy's gonna try to take down a a dire wolf with a katana. This is stupid. This is anime bullshit. Ignoring the fact that this, before that shot specifically was the text that said, "What would you sacrifice?" Implying, therefore, this dude is not making it out of this fight. Mm. That's yeah. kind of the point. <laughs> I, I kind of either imagine, I, it's been a while since I watched that video, but I kind of imagine that uh, he was going to either goad the uh, dire wolf into distracting him for a bit, or mm -hmm. he would get the clanner to step out of the mech to try and fight him one-on-one -on -one in some manner, either to, well, you know... Right, because that, that is some, like, honor bullshit a clanner would pull. Oh, yeah. you don't have a mech and you're drawing a sword? That, I better that... get out and fight you. That literally happened in the the Twilight of the Clans twice. <laughs> I do, oh, I do, really? I do. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. This is great. This is great. I think it was in. I think it was in Shadows of War. The We're Out of Coffee book. There's a moment where, uh, like, Pouring out coffee. Where, yeah, yeah. Where, where like a uh, Draconis Combine, like uh, stealth agent, like what, whatever their their like. Uh, their SEAL Team 6 is essentially is like infiltrated one of the clan genetic repositories, like one of the centers of government, right? And he is screwed because he is cornered by a whole bunch of elementals, which are like these giant roided out monsters of infantrymen. One of them is like the enemy Khan, the leader of the other clan. How does he get out of, like, how does he try to get out of this? He challenges basically the president of the clan to a duel with katanas. <laughs> And the dude takes it, right? And then it later ha it later happens again with like Victor Davian, basically dueling the same dude again, but this time he actually wins. <laughs> like I don't know.
it's it's fun. It's it's different authors handling it, and I think it's sort of important when it comes to science fiction universes like BattleTech is that you keep things kind of loose. Don't keep the lore too rigid. Let people have their fun and keep things in the realm of myth. Well, maybe that happened. Maybe, maybe that right. That was it. Let, yeah. let like, don't uh, become a reader don't become a katana re man. Yeah. And don't and don't let the <laughs> setting kind of turn into Star Wars, where like. Greedo's the style of toothpick Greedo is known to use has been given yeah. three three books and four <laughs> articles like that that sort of thing it ruins the mystique of the setting. Yeah, I yeah, get a lot guys, of comments Darth about Vader's that. Darth Vader's helmet is made out of Wudu hide. Oh yeah. god, it's so cool. Okay, but like that's actually that's actually one of the things I really really appreciated about Mech Warrior Dark Age when they tried to like reboot everything. They set they, the they were made of voodoo hide. Yeah, the helmets were made of voodoo hide, and it was all in a pocket. <laughs> <laughs> they like the, the 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 big like plot point of the Mech Warrior Dark Age like story is something happened to the interstellar communications like array, and now it's like space AT and T is either no longer exists or is no longer able to like take your calls, so you can no longer ship post across the galaxy. <laughs> you have to wait for a jump ship to get into your system, send a drop ship up to that jump ship, wait a week to get to it, wait another week for the thing to recharge, then you jump out, and like a month later, your your like your ship post is gonna get maybe a few light years away to like like maybe out of the system, right? Yeah. Essentially, isolating every planet. Right. Which basically means that, like, a giant swath of the galaxy that up until this point had had meticulous detail on, like, on everything. It was like, no, you got, like, a couple of farmers. They've got, they've got their, like, farming mechs. And now there are pirates. Yeah. They're strapped I, machine guns to the farming mechs. I <laughs> like that a lot more than nuking everything. Like, if it's just yeah. suddenly out of the blue, we have 100 years of peace after Clan Smoke Jaguar got fucked over. And all of a sudden, everything, all communication is shut down. Just leave the world at that and start the dark age that would have been yeah. fantastic in my mind you see like there's there's a levels of like how well to do a retcon in my opinion mm -hmm. um and on one end like 40k has done a bunch of garbo retcon where they just dump whatever they were doing but one of the best things about 40k is they have this habit of being like okay in this edition we're gonna redesign the space marines to look this way uh and the previous edition models like the the best design i can think of is the beakies the the mark six corvus armor that was like Eagle screech <laughs> yeah uh that is that was the default space marine armor in rogue trader mm -hmm. and when they redesigned them in the early 2000s or no not the early 2000s the 90s uh to have the darth vader grills oh, like um, that like the bionicle face yeah uh they they basically instead of retconning it they essentially if you see an old janky model it's that they're literally using like heresy era or just earlier era stuff which, which isn't is necessarily really, worse either right it's a really good way to do uh of course the exception to this is the fucking primaris marines which like i won't even get into yeah Prim that's that, that whole that whole move was like that's primaris kind of Go home, re. That's all I have to say on that. <laughs> Super verse space marine. That's fine. But okay, but like the the narrative thing that I do really appreciate about the 40k universe is that the writers and the narrative itself kind of supports like a certain degree of retconning in a way where they simply say the size and scale of this universe and the nature of the governing factions within it are such that information is often muddled confused fabricated right. or it's just outright lies and you can't really tell what is and is not the truth so just do whatever the fuck you want like don't but, worry about it yeah like it's a big fucking universe if you want to have i don't know cat people be in the imperial guard it's fine just have them do their own thing you know right that's the sort of approach that i i try to take like in the mac lab videos i try to gently combine the lore of battle tech uh in from the game series uh, and the actual lore a bit. But anytime there's a specific number mentioned, like specifically all the technical readouts talk about there are only 14 catapults in existence and no right. more, even though that's the most iconic mech, everyone loves it. Yeah. But there are only 14 and 11 of them are owned by House Liao and they're in this 
these particular units and the other three are in this mercenary unit and the FRR and there are no other in existence. Right. Don't like, limit your setting like that. Yeah, it's yeah, or the, horrible. Or the, yeah. or the fact that like the Battle of Tukayid, like the single largest and essentially most important single battle, single mech engagement in the Battletech universe where the Inner Sphere basically put a stop to the clan invasion has been written out and detailed to the point where you know the exact movements of every unit of every faction on that entire planet so yeah. that there's no longer any room for people just to be like oh yeah i've got i've got this homebrew mercenary company that happens to be there you know yeah yeah which Ugh. just for stuff like that i just ignore it let let it just fade yeah if i ever fictional alternate history yeah if i ever I, do I a mech lab like... video where it brings up information like that i just ignore it just, okay don't need to know let it die and like my my whole theory is like if i'm ever gonna whenever i'm working on a BattleTech project or anything of any like anything in the mech warrior universe it's always going to be set on some like bullshit backwater world that no one's heard of because then you know you can yes. just, it gives you a little bit more leeway to do what you want with it and honestly yeah, like that way that uh, way like, no one can tell you oh the 25th era donny light horse was that planet barlow not yeah. planet tukayid no you're wrong yeah and also like like for me the most engaging battle tech stories has have always been a small cast of characters on a single planet trying to make the next day a little bit better than yesterday was yeah i absolutely you know? agree yeah that's why i like mech warrior 3 so much mm. honestly that's why i really like the original plot of mech warrior 4 like it's super simple yeah. you you are a noble you are off fighting the clans uh this this other state power came in and killed your entire family now you're on the planet and your job is to take the planet back and get the bastards that's it that's the story right and like the like, i do appreciate the like galaxy hopping that mech warrior 4 mercenaries did but the original like mech warrior for vengeance the original game had uh it had an air of like place to it in which like you're 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 still just like transitioning between level menu screen level menu screen level menu screen but it's framed as in you're now you're you've you've uh set up your forward staging base on this planet's moon okay now we're able to move into the arctic okay now now we've, we've uh taken out the communications right in the arctic we can move on and start like liberating the factory districts in the desert you start like move through the planet itself as you're moving through biomes and it feels like you're actually taking place by place different continents and different specific locations on this like on this world it feels a little like a little more real a little bit more lived in yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it gives some personality to it. Like, this is almost a weird digression, but it's almost why I sort of like the the Phantom Menace in in Star Wars because they actually bother to flesh out a single planet instead of yeah, uh, yeah. visiting a bunch of other ones. The rest of the movie's trash, though. But I like that element. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait. 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 Duel of Fates. Uh. Well, you know, John Williams. He's not part of the movie because he does everything well. Yeah. You know, he, it's a given that he does a good job, except yeah. for maybe in Rise of Skywalker, because no one remembers anything from that movie. Well, apparently, the what what I've heard is that for the sequel trilogy, like particularly the Last Jedi, not the Last Jedi, the Rise of Skywalker. Sorry, I'm mixing them up because that apparently that's how forgettable these movies have become, or like how intertwined they've become. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, John Williams' originally score, the original score, the one that was sent to the Academy as like their for your consideration, uh, for his, the academy award for that movie basically none of it was used and he wrote like three hours of original music music that no one has heard before hmm. that kind of reminds me of how uh this is a bit of a digression i guess but blue oyster cult wrote the entire or like they blue oyster cult wrote most of the album uh fire of unknown origin for the heavy metal movie and they owned it, only ended up using one song from that album, and it was one of the two songs on the album they had not written for the movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, or like, or like uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. 
where they they just went with also Sparag Zathura, however you pronounce it. And the dude who wrote the score, an original score to the movie, I think like I think I'm remembering this right, didn't find out that they had replaced his entire original score until he was in the theater watching the premiere. Oh, oh fuck, where's my music? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he's just, he's just looking like, over at Kubrick while this this thunderous classical piece is playing. Like, what the fuck? It reminds me of that lady who what the fuck, dude? wrote the original book of Mary Poppins. Mm-hmm. And it, it was apparently like based off a real nanny that she had growing up that like really changed her life. Uh, and she watched it in theaters. And like whenever the fuck that came out, uh, when she sold the rights to it. And in, in the original book, which nobody's ever read, because, like, who would? Uh, there's no magic at all. It's literally just, like, an emotional story about a girl bonding with her nanny and becoming a better person. Well, and, the magic, the magic was, was love anyway. It's fine. And she basically comes out of the theater and says something to the limited vocabulary 80s effective, I can't believe Walt Disney raped my childhood. Like, God damn. It's like... So adaptation is just a crapshoot, like, or, or, or like know. like like the guy that was the original rubber suit man for all the Godzilla movies walking out of the 1998 American Godzilla movie, saying that 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 thing on the screen that's not Godzilla. Does it have his spirit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, but like <laughs> kind of like let's look back at it, like the cgi specifically the cgi for the 1998 godzilla movie was not bad for 1998 one two the soundtrack for the 1998 godzilla movie is actually amazing and no one remembers it yeah like i'd say that even there are some like rather poor pieces of media that have really good aspects to them Mm -hmm. but because they're otherwise forgettable or poor they never really get the time or attention they deserve I kind of like hoarding those moments yeah. <laughs> by the way I hate to interrupt but i think this podcast has been going for like at least an hour and 50 minutes uh, we're <laughs> like the two hour mark in about yeah. 90 seconds we need to wrap this up i think yeah, yeah. Um, okay so i think i might have a wrap question for everyone then if that sure. helps yeah uh what what is the thing that you are working on right now if you can like of the things that you can talk about that you are working on right now that you are most excited for uh, i guess i'll start since it's my panel and i actually have a project uh I, just to procrastinate i started farting out a little star wars animation uh and i i started uh tinkering with some cinematic effects to try and make it really look like the uh original trilogy and it, so far, it actually seems to be coming out really well. And the best part is, I have four minutes of footage, and I started three days ago. <laughs> oh, hell yes. Planes, man. So yeah, many dude. Fewer points of articulation. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. So, uh, what's. All right. What are you working on, other guys? I guess I'll go. Go for it. First of all,. I'm probably going to do some voice acting for the Star Wars animation and, you know, whatever comes after that. But also, I'm currently working on, like, writing this book, the story, this novel, whatever. Yeah. It's a post-apocalyptic story, which is set centuries after an atomic bombing, and it involves this, these knights, like medieval knights, fighting for the last little vestige of water in the Mojave Desert, where all the survivors of the apocalypse are hanging out. It's called Mojave Nights. Ah. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to like share it online. Or... Oh my god, that's wild. <laughs> that rules. I like it. What about yeah, you, Crow? I'm not really sure where I would share it online, even if I really did want to. But I am working on that. Cool. Uh, Crow, did you have a current project you're working on? Uh, kind of. I, I generally do well with, like, short story format stuff. Because mm-hmm. I'll get the idea for, like, one scene in my head. And then if I try and do anything beyond that, it'll just kind of fall apart. Or, um, like, spirals out of control. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, there are too many plot points. And I'll look back at something. And, like, I'll just, like, run myself in circles like that. Um, 
I don't want to sound coy, but I'd say this podcast, even if it doesn't go anywhere, is probably the thing I'm most excited for creatively at the moment. It's a very hey, nice yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dan, did you have any particular project you were working on? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm in like maybe the last third stretch of working on another hand-drawn MechWarrior animatic, not a full animation. A full animation of something like this is, would be Kill you. years, oh, shit. probably. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's it's nuts. I'm, I'm like trying to, I'm trying to like build up a portfolio for, uh, to be like a storyboard artist or something like that. Hmm. Uh, so like that's one thing. The second thing that has finally like, you know how how like for years you keep like striking matches on a project and eventually it catches fire. Yeah, I know what you're talking. Yeah. About. So about uh, two months ago, I finally finished the script for the first volume of a graphic novel webcomic whatever whatever you want to do that has been like knocking around in my head for the last like three years yeah. of a uh, uh a thrilling uh and heartfelt uh fantasy adventure story set in a world made entirely out of robots like the planet itself is made of just billions of robots. That's pretty awesome. There, are, there are no people. There are no animals. It's just robots. Basically, like here's like here's the hook, right? Like a long time ago, the old gods sent us from the sky. What is it with you and old to, gods, Mike? I, I, I like the idea of old gods. The old gods sent us from, sent us from the sky to prepare this desert world for their arrival. We turned this world into a garden. And when we sent our prayer back up into the heavens, no one answered. Mm. Like and then it. it's like, yeah, it's, then it's just like a whole bunch of robots going, okay, what the fuck do we do now then? Kind of reminds me of uh, the short cool. story, to Replace a Man, if any of you have ever uh, read that. To Replace a Man? Who can replace a man? Who can replace? I'm Googling that. I'm going to keep that for later. Yeah, I'll have to yeah. look that up. It sounds interesting. It's like, uh, your story sounds like maybe uplifting if like the robots get their act together. Who can replace a man is why robots are shit and humans rule. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm 100% on the side of these robots. These robots are going to have like big googly anime eyes. And all the battle tech oh. folks are going to fucking hate it. I thought you were going to say something besides eyes, but that works too. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would like to have like, uh, this was a lot of fun. I think we should have like, I don't know, a theme to talk about next time, like topics and shit. But uh, sure. yeah, this was very yeah. Cool work setting. Yeah, this was a also, good start. Like maybe have a like a timer to make sure that we don't go for two hours. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to stop us I mean, for the last forty-five minutes, honestly, but uh, we just no, kept no. going. <laughs> I mean, there are podcasts that go for like five hours. Okay, yeah, all right, everyone, sit down. About for, an hour yeah. is where you where you want it to be. Okay, we'll go for another yeah. three hours, Anyways. then maybe think about calling it a <laughs> it's night. It's small enough to put in your pocket. It's fine. <laughs> no, I'll. I'll <laughs> A pocket cast. Yeah, right. we're gonna call it. So, pocket cast. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Speaking of pockets, this is the. I'm calling it here. This is the end of the first episode of Farcast. Yes. Uh, check out Dan's page at DC Bruins on YouTube. Just uh, type it in the search bar, and check out Farseer Animation. You're already here, I hope. If not, someone else has uploaded this. In which case, give us attention, please. Um, anyway. <laughs> That was it. So uh, we'll catch you guys later. I have no social media. And we'll battle so on in the future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, good luck. I'm behind seven proxies. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. see you, boys. See you around. All right. Later.